Our passage this morning is from the book of Matthew. Matthew's the first book in the New Testament. And we are in chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Thank you, Nikki. Well, this morning, we are continuing our sermon series on the church, and we're nearing the end. And so I'm preaching this morning. Jared's going to be preaching next week and wrapping up the series. Then we have Easter, and then we have everybody's favorite book um, of the Bible, uh, starting a sermon series in the book of Revelation. Uh, But we're not there yet. Uh, This is the second to last sermon um, in the series on the church. And, And as we come to this sermon this morning, Um, we're really going to ask and and answer probably the most practical question that we've asked or answered up to this point in this sermon series on the church. And that question is this, who has authority to do what in the church? Or to to personalize that for for our church, who, who has authority to do what in this church? Who has authority to do what in Cross Fellowship Church? In other words, who in our church has the authority to determine what our church budget is? Who who in our church has authority to determine where we meet on Sunday mornings and what time we meet on Sunday mornings? Who has authority in our church to select and choose our next elders? Who, Who has authority in our church to change a section of our church bylaws? Who who has authority in our church to remove someone from membership in our church or to receive someone in membership in our church? I could go on and on and on and on, but you see the questions, right? Who who has authority to make all these decisions in the church, in, in this particular church? And if you think about it, like, that's a really important question. And one reason it's important is because if we don't have an answer for that and a common agreed upon understanding and answer to that question, then we have mass chaos. Utter chaos, utter confusion. Everybody thinks it's them or them or them or whoever who has the right and the authority to make these decisions. And it leads to all sort of chaos and confusion and power struggles and everything else. Like, just think about your workplace for a minute. Or just think about your family. And think about just what a chaotic mess it would be if nobody knew who was in charge. And nobody knew who had the final say in in all these decisions. Nobody had a clue. Think about what your workplace would be like if that was the case. Think about what your family would be like if... Three-year-old Johnny didn't know that you were in charge. It'd be utter chaos and madness. But it's more than just that. Whoever has authority also has certain responsibilities that come with the authority that they possess. And we know this, right? Like, think about a, about a principal at a, at a school. Like, there are certain responsibilities that come with that position of authority of being a principal of a school. Or think about your boss at your workplace. There are certain responsibilities that come with that position of authority of being your boss at your, at your job, at your workplace. 
And the same is true when it comes to the life of, of a church, of, of this church. That those who have authority in the church also have certain responsibilities that come with the authority that they possess in the church. And that is precisely what I'm hoping that your eyes will be able to see and that you'll be able to feel the weight of during this sermon this morning. That in this sermon, I want to show you the authority that you possess in this church. Let me say that again. In this sermon, my primary goal is to show you the authority that you as a member of this church have and possess. And that as you see the authority that you have and possess as a member of this church, that then I want to show you the responsibilities. The, the responsibilities then that come with the authority that you possess as a member of this church. And then as you see the authority that you possess and the specific responsibilities that come with the authority that, that come with the authority that you possess that the reality of those things then would completely just like blow your mind and, and transform how you think about church and how you think about your role as a member of this particular local church. And so then let's begin with that initial question that I began with this sermon, that I began this sermon with, that I just asked a few minutes ago. Who has authority to do what in the church? Who has authority to establish the budget? Who has authority to determine where we meet on Sunday mornings? Who has authority to select our next elders to change the bylaws? All those things. So in answering that question, I want us to first look at the authority of the congregation, meaning the authority that you possess as a member of this church. And as we do that, what we're gonna see is that, is that the congregation you have authority in three specific areas in the church. First, you have authority in matters of membership and discipline. In matters of membership and discipline. And we see this in, in two specific places in the Bible. In the first place we see it, if you turn back two chapters in Matthew 18, flip back to Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, starting there in verse 13. Here's what Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, I'm going to read down to verse 20, verse 19, verse 20. Now, when Jesus came in the, in the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am. And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So then Jesus asked, who do people say that I am? And all these people, the disciples are telling him, here's who everybody says that you are. And they don't know who Jesus is. They don't know the correct identity of who Jesus is. And so Peter pipes up, and he makes this confession. He says, I know who you are. You are the, are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then look at what Jesus says to Peter in verse 18. Jesus responds by saying to Peter, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so then the million-dollar question here in verse 18 is, what's the rock that Jesus is referring to here? What, what's the rock that Jesus is going to build his church on? And so we could have a sermon in and of itself on that specific question that we don't have time for. There's a lot of debate here. But at the very, very least, the rock is a reference to 
the confession that Peter just made about Jesus in verse 16. The confession that he made that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's, that confession is the rock that Jesus is going to build his church on. He's going to build his church with those who make the same confession that Peter made here. He's going to build it with those who confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Look then at what Jesus tells Peter in the very next verse in verse 19. He says, I will give you, talking about Peter here, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what in the world does, does that mean? Well, stay, stay with me real quick. What Jesus is doing here is he's giving Peter, kind of as the representative apostle, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which gives Peter then and, and the rest of the apostles the, the authority to do what Jesus just did to Peter here. Namely, render a judgment on heaven's behalf as to whether or not someone's confession is true or not true, just like Jesus did with Peter here. That's what binding and, and this binding and loosing language here is all about. The word bind here means to prohibit or forbid something. And the word loose means to, to permit or to allow something. That's what it means to, to bind or, or loose here. It, it means to make judgments about what is and what is not permitted. And in verse 19, this is the authority then that Jesus is giving to Peter and the apostles. He's giving them the keys of the kingdom, which is the authority to hear a confession and render a judgment on heaven's behalf and say, that's a right, true confession, or that's a wrong, false confession, just like Jesus did with Peter here. Now, remember that. As we turn forward, turn to the, left, or to the right now, back to Matthew 18, and look at verses 15 through 20 that Nikki just read a minute ago. And as you do that, keep Matthew 16 in the background. So in Matthew 18, the passage Nikki just read, we, we've kind of gone through this, these verses before, so I'm not going to dig too deeply into them. But Jesus is speaking here about, with his disciples about what they're to do with the professing brother, professing Christian, who's living in continual ongoing repentance sin. Unre unrepentant sin, excuse me. And in verse 15, here's what he tells them to do. He tells them, he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if, he, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if, if he refuses to listen even to the church then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So again, we, we went through verses 15 through 17 specifically a few weeks ago, so we're not going to dive deeply into those again. But in these verses, again, what Jesus is doing, he's explaining what we're to do when a professing brother or sister in Christ is living in continual, ongoing, unrepentant sin, and when their, when their life is out of step with his or her confession. When that happens, one person is going to go to them and urge them to repent. If, if they don't listen to them, then that person is to take one or two others along with them. If the professing brother or sister of Christ still doesn't listen to them and still doesn't repent, then they're to tell it to the church. And if they don't listen to the church then the church is to treat the professing brother or sister as an unbeliever. Meaning, they're to remove him or her from the covenant community 
because they're no longer able to affirm their confession and profession of faith, because their life no longer matches their confession and profession of faith. And so then, what we're talking about here, like, is heavy, heavy, heavy stuff, especially in a culture in which nobody's supposed to judge anybody about anything. We're talking about a heavy, heavy decision here. Which begs the question then, who has the authority and the right to make this decision? Who who gets to make it? Who has the authority to render this sort of judgment about a professing Christian and to look at him and say, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, your life doesn't match your confession. You're an unbeliever. Who has the right and the authority to do that? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 18 of Matthew 18. Look there with me. He says, truly I say to you. You might want to underline or circle that word you there. It's really important. That word you there isn't in the singular. That word you there is in the plural. So if you're from Oklahoma, you, should, you would translate it as y'all. Truly I say to y'all, you, you, you all. Talk about a group of people here. Which begs the question, who's the y'all here within the context here? Well, the y'all is, is the church. It's, it's in verse 17, it's the church. And look what he tells the church, the plurality, the church, the gathered church, the assembly. In the rest of verse 18, he says, truly I say to y'all, the church, whatever y'all, the church, Bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever y'all, the church, loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So you read verse 18, you're like, hey, I've heard that somewhere before. This, This language seems really familiar to me. And I'm like, you're right. We just read it in Matthew 16. When Jesus gave Peter the keys of the kingdom, and when Jesus gave Peter the authority to bind and loose and to render judgments about what is and isn't a true confession, now he's giving that that same authority, he's giving the, the same keys and the same authority to who? To us, to you, the church. Now we, the church, have the authority to stand in front of a professing brother or sister in Christ and consider his or her gospel confession, Matthew 16, and to consider his or her life and whether or not, whether or not it matches his or her confession, Matthew 18, and then to render a judgment on heaven's behalf and say, this is or isn't a true gospel confession. And this is or isn't a true gospel confessor. Meaning their life does or doesn't match their confession, Matthew 18. Like this is the authority that Jesus has given to us as a church. We have the authority to render these judgments as a church. And if Jesus wasn't clear enough, he he repeats himself. He says the same exact thing in a different way in verses 19 and 20. Look there with me. He goes on to say in verse 19, again, I say to you, and again, that word, the word used plural, again, I say to y'all, the church, meaning, again, I'm going to say it again. I've already said it once, verse 18, but I'm going to say it to you again just in a different way. If two of you, that's what it takes to have a church, agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. So verse 19 and 20 here are oftentimes taken out of context to refer to a prayer gathering. That if you have two or three Christians praying together about something, then Jesus is with them and God will give them whatever they pray for. 
The problem is that's not the context here of these verses and what these verses are referring to. They're not referring to Christians gathering to pray together. They're referring to the church gathering together to exercise church discipline and render a judgment about a professing Christian's profession of faith. And what Jesus is saying is when you do that, he's with you, he's with us, meaning we're doing that based upon his authority that he has given to us. And so this is the authority then and the responsibility that we have a church, that we have as a church. This is the responsibility that Jesus has given us as a church, that he's given you as a member of this church. Jesus has given us the keys of the kingdom, and therefore we have the authority to assess a person's gospel words, meaning their confession, Matthew 16. And we have the authority to assess a person's deeds, Matthew 18, and to render a judgment as to whether or not they have a true gospel confession and are a true gospel confessor. And so then the way we practically do this as a church, the way we practically exercise this authority and carry out this responsibility as a church in our church is when we vote to affirm new members into our church. And when we vote to exercise church discipline and remove members from our church, that each time you vote, you're exercising the keys of the kingdom and saying, this person has or doesn't have a true, right gospel confession. And this person is or isn't a true gospel confessor meaning their life does or doesn't match their confession. And therefore, they are or they aren't a true brother or sister in Christ. That's the authority you as a congregation, you as the members of the church, have been given by Jesus. You have authority in matters of church membership and matters of church discipline. But that's not all. Secondly, you as a congregation also have authority in matters of church leadership. Matters of church leadership. Now, I want to be really careful here. I don't, I don't see anything explicit in Scripture that I can take you to that the church voted on and, and had the authority to decide on who its elders and deacons were going to be. I can't, I can't show you any explicit verse and chapter in the Bible that commands that or, or gives an explicit example of that. And so the only time we see anyone appointing elders in a church is the Apostle Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 14, when during their missionary journey, they went back to the churches they had planted and appointed to elders in each of them. And the second time we see it is in Titus chapter 1, when Paul instructs Titus to appoint elders in Crete. That's all we got. Unfortunately, we don't have an apostle with a capital A in our church to appoint elders here in our church, like Paul. So the question then is, who has the authority then to appoint elders and deacons in our church then? Well, again, we're not explicitly told and since we're not explicitly told, I want to be very careful of being overly dogmatic on an issue that the Bible isn't overly dogmatic on, like church discipline and membership that we just saw. But here are two hints, though, in Scripture that seem to indicate that the congregation had the responsibility to appoint church leaders. The first hint is in the book of Acts. When you see the church over and over again choosing and appointing its own leaders. So one example of this is in Acts chapter 6 verse 3. When the 12 apostles tell the, the full number of disciples there in Jerusalem to choose seven men who meet certain qualifications to serve and care for the needy widows in Jerusalem. Another example is in Acts chapter 11. When the church at Jerusalem chose Barnabas and sent Barnabas to Antioch so he could confirm the reports of the Gentile conversions in Antioch. 
Another example is in Acts chapter 13. When the church at Antioch chose and selected Paul and Barnabas and commissioned them on their first missionary journey. On that same journey then, uh, uh, or on that, that same church then, commissioned Paul and Silas on their second missionary journey in Acts chapter 15. Later on in Acts chapter 15, verse 22, the whole church was involved in selecting Judas and Silas to accompany Paul and Barnabas to to Antioch. And there's a couple others. But the picture here throughout Acts is, is you see the role of the church in selecting and choosing leaders who would lead them and who would represent them. The other hint that we see when it comes to the congregation's authority to choose its leaders, you don't have to turn there, but it's in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. That in 1 Timothy 5, 19 and 20, you have the congregation who's given the authority to rebuke an elder. The congregation is given the authority to rebuke an elder who's in sin. And so then when an elder goes astray and is in sin, then who has the authority to correct him? Who has the authority to rebuke him? The congregation has the authority and the right to correct him and rebuke him. And so then again, these these are more implicit rather than explicit examples and commands of of the church having authority to, to choose and appoint its leaders, its elders, and its deacons. But they are examples and and hints that we see throughout Scripture of the role of the congregation having the authority and taking the responsibility to choose its leaders, which then leads to the third and final area the congregation has authority in, in the life of the church, and that's in matters of doctrine, in matters of doctrine. In other words, here's what I mean by that. Throughout Scripture, Whenever the leaders and the teachers of a, of a church went off the rails doctrinally, they went AWOL theologically. And false teaching and false teachers began to infiltrate the church, and the teachers of that, those churches began to teach heresy. Then do you know when, when that happened, then do you know who had the authority and the responsibility to stand up and do something about it? You, the congregation. Like whenever the leaders of the church began to teach heresy, the biblical writers didn't write to those churches and say, sorry guys, they're they're the elders. They're the ones in authority. There's nothing you can really do about it. Just got to kind of sit back and listen to their heresy. Sorry. No, (laughs) no. It's not, it's, not, it's not what the biblical writers say at all. It's so that the biblical writers write to these churches, to these congregations, and they're like, do something about it. Don't let that continue. Correct them, rebuke them. You have the authority and responsibility to do something about it. The most glaring example of this is in the book of Galatians. There are leaders and teachers in those churches that are teaching a false gospel. And so Paul writes to the churches in Galatia and tells them to exercise judgment against those who are preaching a false gospel. He does the same thing in 2 Corinthians. He does the same thing in 2 John. That the congregation is the one who has authority and responsibility to guard and preserve the purity of the gospel in the church. They are to judge and remove those leaders and teachers who teach a false gospel. Which again takes us back to Matthew chapter 16. And the authority that the church has to render a judgment on true and false gospel confessions. True and false gospel doctrine. So the authority belongs to the church. And so then, those are the three areas We're going to get real practical here in a minute. But those are the three areas that you as a congregation have authority in, in the church, in this church. That you, the congregation, the members of the church, have authority in matters of membership, discipline, choosing leaders, and preserving the purity of the gospel and and sound doctrine in, in this church. 
That's your authority. That's your responsibility. Which then begs this question. Okay, then if the congregation has authority in, in these areas, then what about the elders? What, what authority, if any, do the elders then have in, in the church? Because as I read my Bible, you, you might be thinking, it sure seems like the elders have some sort of authority. I mean, like 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Hebrews 13.17, say submit, submit to the elders. 1 Timothy 5.17 talks about elders who rule, who rule well in the church. So then it seems like elders have some sort of authority in the church. And if that's the case, then how does the congregation have authority and the elders have authority? And how do these two spheres of authority relate and work together? Now, I don't know if you go to bed at night thinking that question and if that question keeps you up at night. It's a good question. And think about it this way, though. Whereas the congregation has authority in matters of membership, discipline, leaders, and leadership, and doctrine, the elders then have authority to shepherd and oversee the church by teaching, protecting, caring for, and leading the church. So then practically speaking, th think about then the, the four areas we just talked about, membership, discipline, choosing leaders, and doctrine. When it comes to those four areas, elders then provide leadership and oversight in those four areas, in, in membership, discipline, choosing leaders, and doctrine. Elders provide leadership and oversight in those areas, but the congregation has the final say in these matters. So then, take membership as an example. As elders, we lead out in our membership process as a church. We teach the membership class. We receive and review membership applications. We do membership interviews. Then we recommend prospective members to you, the members of our church. And then you vote. You exercise the keys of the kingdom. You vote to either affirm or not affirm those that we've recommended based on whether or not, they believe, whether or not you believe they meet our membership requirements and whether or not they have a true gospel confession, Matthew 16, and are a true gospel confessor, Matthew 18. If you don't know them, those that we've recommended and aren't sure, then we don't expect you to try and go around and have a membership interview with every single prospective member that we're, that we're recommending. Instead, and we'll talk more about that here in just a minute, but instead... You can either trust the elders that you've affirmed to oversee and, and lead this process and vote for those that we've affirmed. Or you can abstain from voting since you don't personally know each of those prospective members and you aren't sure. Either way is great. Or think about church discipline in that process. Like most of the church discipline cases that we've had in our church begin with you as members doing the work of a member, confronting a brother or sister in sin. And then somewhere down the line, you, you reach out to us as elders and involve us. And at that point in the process, then we as elders seek to lead and over, oversee the final steps of the, of the process. And if it gets to the point then where the professing member won't repent of their sin and willfully continues in it, then we as elders will recommend that you as a congregation because you're the one who has authority to do this, that you as a congregation vote to remove them from membership. And then you as a congregation vote to determine whether or not you can continue to affirm their profession of faith or whether they should be removed from membership and viewed as an unbeliever. Or think about what we're doing right now with selecting and, and seeking to add new elders. That as elders, we, we have led out and overseen the process of of selecting and recommending new elders. We've asked you for your nominations and recommendations. Then we've spent months assessing and evaluating these different guys. Two weeks ago then, we recommended to you uh, three men that we as elders believe meet the, the qualifications and responsibilities of an elder as defined in Scripture. So now we're taking five weeks to pray 
and to ask questions and voice any concerns to us as elders or, or to the specific elder candidates. Then immediately after the service on April the 7th, you, the church, will vote whether or not to affirm the three men that we recommended. Then finally, think about doctrine and the doctrine in our church, the doctrine in our church. Like Jared and I, we, we seek to preach and teach sound doctrine. But if we ever begin to go AWOL theologically and to go off the rails biblically and theologically and begin to preach a different gospel, begin to preach heresy, a false gospel, and all that, it's your job and authority and responsibility to get rid of us. And so then, this is how the authority of the congregation and the authority of the elders plays itself out, how it works, works together in these four areas, in matters of membership, discipline, choosing leaders, and doctrine. And this is, and what I just described has a name. It's known as elder-led congregationalism. That elders lead out in these areas, but the congregation has the final ultimate authority and say in these areas. Not the elders don't have the final say and authority in these areas. Some denomination doesn't have the final say and authority in these areas. Some bishop outside of our church doesn't have final say and authority in these areas. Some external outside governing body outside our local congregation doesn't have final authority and say in these matters. You, the congregation, have the final say and authority in these matters as we seek to lead us in these areas. If that's the case then, what about all the other areas in the church then? Like who has final say and authority in all the other areas in the church outside of these four specific areas? Well, as those who've been affirmed by the congregation to shepherd and lead and oversee the church, the elders have authority to shepherd and lead all other areas of the church. So then, think about this. Think, think about like areas of ministry, areas of discipleship in our church, like what sermon series we're going to preach next, or what songs we're going to sing on Sunday morning, what equipping classes we're going to offer, what ministry teams we're going to have, who's going to lead these ministry teams, how we're going to structure just ministry in our church. Are we going to have discipleship communities or small groups or all those things? The congregation has affirmed the elders to lead and shepherd and oversee the ministry and discipleship in the church. And so then these aren't things that we vote on. Or, or think about other areas of oversight and, and even administrative areas and decisions in the life of our church. Like the church budget, or where we meet on Sunday morning, or what time we meet on Sunday morning, and things like that. Again, the congregation has affirmed the elders to lead and oversee the day-in, day-out ministry responsibilities in the life of the church. That doesn't mean then that elders don't ever consult the congregation or don't ever seek to receive feedback from the congregation. Like humility and wisdom would mean that we seek feedback and input from the congregation in all these areas. And it also doesn't mean that, that we never have the congregation then vote on any of these issues. Like this is one of the reasons we vote on our church budget each year. Like, we don't do that because there's a chapter and verse in the Bible that says the congregation has authority over the church budget. Like we believe it, it, it does when it talks about membership and discipline and leader, choosing leaders and doctrine and those things. Instead, we as elders have the congregation vote on the church budget because we think it's the wise and prudent thing to do. We think it's wise for the church to affirm its spending plan. And so then, I know all that doesn't answer every question that you have, but this is who has authority to do what in the church. This is the authority of the congregation and the authority of the elders in the church. Let's then conclude 
with this last and final question, which is this. What difference should any of this make on you as a member of this church? If it's true that you have authority in matters of membership, discipline, choosing leaders, and doctrine in our church, then what difference should this make on how you live as a member of this church? Let me give you four, four differences it should make or four ways you should respond. And I reworded some of these from, from what's initially on your handout here. But first, if, if all this is true, if this is the authority you have, then first, the first difference it should make is this. You should attend and participate in members' meetings. Look, pr- hopefully that's obvious, right? Like our members' meetings are the one place that you as a congregation exercise the keys of the kingdom and render judgments on true gospel confessors and confessions as you affirm new members into our church and remove members through church discipline. And it's the one context you choose leaders. And if that's the case, then you need to be here. Like there's four of them a year, quarterly members meetings. You need to be here so you can exercise the authority and the responsibilities that you've been given by Jesus in our church. Secondly, the reality of the authority you possess should cause you, secondly, to get to know members and potential members in our church. I reworded that a little bit, but to get to know members and potential members in our church. In other words, if you have the authority and responsibility to affirm true gospel confessors, you can't do that if you don't know them. You you can't do it. So then it's important you try and get to know those who've been regularly visiting our church but aren't yet members, but who one day may go through our membership process, or for those who are in the midst of our membership process. And it's important you know and take responsibility for the spiritual growth and well-being of other members in our church. And again, that, that doesn't mean that you're, responsibility, you're responsible to personally know every visitor and to know every member of our church. Like, we do this work collectively together. But if we're responsible to affirm those who have a true gospel confession and those who are true gospel confessors, then you're going to work hard at getting to know those who are regular visitors and who are, who are members of our church. Third difference it should make in your life as a member is this. It's to guard the gospel and sound doctrine in the church. To guard the gospel and to guard sound doctrine in the church. In other words, study this book. Like study sound theology, study sound doctrine, know the truth of the gospel, know the false gospels that are permeating in the culture in which we live so you can protect and preserve the gospel and sound doctrine in this church. So if I or Jared ever go off the rails or any other elder ever go off the rails, theologically and doctrinally, the church doesn't go off the rails with us. Instead, if that ever happens... You stand and protect and guard and preserve the gospel and sound doctrine in this church. That's why so many liberal denominations have gone off the rails theologically. One reason is because of their church government and how they've answered the question, who has authority in the church? The top people have the ultimate authority and say in the church. And so when the top people go off the rails theologically and doctrinally, the whole church goes off the rails theologically and doctrinally as well. But not in elder-led congregationalism, where the ultimate authority when it comes to preserving the purity and the doctrine of the church is the congregation. So if the top and the leaders go off the rails theologically and doctrinally, the whole church doesn't go off with it. That's the authority and responsibility that you have. Fourthly and finally, then I'll close with this. Fourth way difference it should make is this. 
and I reworded this, but it's to be equipped. Be equipped to exercise your authority and carry out your responsibilities as a church member. In other words, this makes sense, right? Think about this. Think about your authority. Think about the responsibilities you've been given by Jesus. If you've been given the keys of the kingdom, if you've been given the authority to render a judgment on whether or not someone is a true confession and is a true confessor, and if you have been given the authority to, to choose leaders, and if you, you've been given the responsibility to preserve the gospel and sound doctrine in our church, then you need to be sure that you're equipped, that you're equipped to be able to fulfill, to be able to exercise the authority and fulfill the responsibilities that you've been given. Like that's a question to ask yourself. Are you equipped to do these things? I just told you the authority and the responsibility that you have. And the question you need to ask yourself is, Am I ready for that? Am I equipped to do that? Am I capable? Am I able? Am I equipped to, to fulfill those responsibilities that I have as a member of this church? If not, then get equipped. That's why you come to work church regularly every week to sit under the preaching of God's Word. It's to equip you to fulfill the authority and responsibility that you have as a member of this church. Participate in equipping classes that we offer. Be a part of a discipleship community. Find someone in our church, an older Christian that can personally disciple you. Read this word every day. Read good Christian books every day. Continue to grow as a learner every day. You can't exercise the authority that Jesus has given you unless you're adequately equipped to do so. So be equipped. Any Spider-Man fans out there, raise your hand proud. It's okay. Ten of you, that's great. I conclude with the words of Peter Parker's uncle, Ben, that he once told Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. If that was true for Spider-Man, for Peter Parker, then how much, is that true, how much more true is that for you and for us as a church? Jesus has given us and you great power. He's given you great authority. And with that power comes great responsibility. And so then let's exercise the authority we've been given faithfully Let's exercise it humbly. Let's exercise it wisely and carefully. And when the time comes, let's exercise it boldly and courageously. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. Now pray that something and all that has been said and all that we've looked at in your word, that you would use that to help us to open our eyes, to feel the weight of responsibility that we have toward one another and toward others as members together of this church. A whole lot more is going on than just us gathering together on a Sunday morning to see, sing some songs and pray some prayers and listen to a message. A whole lot more is happening um, when it comes to church membership than this just being the church that we're on the membership role of and that we attend. Lord, as members of this church, you've given us great authority and responsibility. Help us to feel the weight of that and pray that the reality of that would cause us to be actively involved and engaged in member meetings, to be actively engaged in getting to know one another, to be actively involved in being equipped, to be actively involved in preserving and protecting the purity of sound doctrine and the gospel in the life of this church. Lord, being a member isn't just a passive role, but it's a job that carries with a great responsibility and involves active involvement and participation. 
And so, Lord, help us to realize the authority that we've been given by you and the glorious responsibilities that come with it. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.